I mean, listen, I'm all about semi-pointless ideas. Keyword, semi. For the most part, I'm going to follow the timeline. His various activities, fencing, I think there's horseback riding, things like that. I will not be doing. So as you can tell from the title, I did try Eric Satie's pretty ridiculous daily routine. He's one of my favorite French composers, and a few weeks ago, I was on this little music history kick, and I was reading up on Satie's life, and of course, I came across this infamous routine of his, which is widely accepted as a work of irony and satire, but I was still curious to see if anyone has tried it, and I couldn't find anything, so I decided that I would try it myself. Before we get into it, I just want to mention that as someone who regularly makes videos, I'm constantly going through many different ideas throughout the month that appeal to me for whatever reason. This one, by far, was one of the most pointless ones that I came up with, yet it ended up being one of the most memorable, creatively inspiring, and thought-provoking video-making experiences for me. To start off, let's talk a little bit about Eric Satie. He was a French composer, or rather a self-proclaimed phonometrician, as he called it, or one who measures sound, who lived from 1866 to 1925. In many ways, his music can be seen as a precursor to minimalism and ambient music, and is characterized with a certain kind of naivete, a meandering quality, and stark simplicity, all in contrast to the type of music that was written during his time. His wit, ironic sense of humor, and avant-garde approach made him a bit of a misfit amongst the higher art society in Paris during the turn of the 20th century, but he was adored by some of the most prominent artists of his time, such as Claude Debussy, Maurice Ravel, Darius Mio, Jean Cocteau, and Pablo Picasso, just to name a few. His most famous works, Gymnopédie and Nocien, have been used in countless modern films and commercials, and he continues to inspire many people even to this day. Now onto his daily routine. So I followed this regimen for three days and stayed true to it 83.7% of the time. An artist must organize his life. Here's the exact timetable of my daily activities. Get up at 7.18 a.m. So that was a little on the early side for me. Be inspired, 10.23 to 11.47 a.m. So I love this category of inspiration because anything goes, really. I take lunch at 12.11 p.m. and leave the table at 12.14. This looks stranger on paper because you can eat quite a bit in three minutes. I eat only white foods, eggs, sugar, scraped bones, chicken cooked in white water, rice, turnips, things like spaghetti, and certain fish minus their skins. It was oddly interesting. White. Mama, thank you for your help. You go this all to your kids. Fine. 1.19 to 2.35 p.m. Healthy horse riding out in my grounds. Yeah, I actually, I actually tried this. More inspiration, 3.12 p.m. to 4.07. 4.21 to 6.47 p.m. Various activities, fencing, reflection, immobility, visits, contemplation, dexterity, swimming, etc. Dinner is served at 7.16 and ends at 7.20 p.m. So a full minute more for dinner. Then symphonic readings out loud from 8.09 to 9.59 p.m. I go to bed regularly at 10.37 p.m. So clearly very particular, very ridiculous. And I was even leaving out some things that were clearly meant to be extra absurd, like sleeping with one eye open, that sort of thing. Definitely check out the whole collection of essays if you get a chance. I recommend it. It's a fun, quick read full of parody. It's very colorful writing and just a lot of fun. There's a lot that I took away from it. And oddly enough, I learned quite a bit about myself as cliche as that sounds. And I started to think a little more about productivity, what it means and what it doesn't. It was designed in a way that promotes healthiness. <laughs> it made me go outside, made me spend time with my family and do things that normally I don't consider productive. We live in a society where productivity is really pushed onto us. Maybe when we're coming up with our schedules, at least it's like that for me. I put work and things that I label as productive as the priority and everything else is secondary. 
but this schedule was sort of inverted. The schedule actually has a lot of space and a lot of time that you can fill in to do work or do other things like letting yourself get bored. I know Sati was fascinated with the idea or the concept of boredom. It also makes me think that maybe we don't always need a reason to do things and maybe our reasons for doing things don't always have to be understood. And I think Sati as a person, as an artist really embodies this and there's something to learn from it. Maybe I'm sitting here trying to fish for lessons learned from all of this, but I really feel that with a lot of Satie's jokes and his sense of humor, there is a deeper meaning within it. There's some truth behind the absurdity. For instance, his three pieces in the shape of a pear. It's a work with actually seven movements. So with that in mind, the title seems like a random joke, but it actually serves as a commentary on the meaning of form and perception. Also his piece, Vexations. On the surface, it's clearly a prank. I mean, it asks you to play the same theme 840 times, but it sort of serves as a commentary against the never-ending quality of late romantic music, especially Wagner operas. I also did a little bit of research on this whole white foods thing to see if there's anything behind it. And I actually found this article that suggests that perhaps this was Satie's ironic response to this monochromatic meal featured in this piece of literature by Joris Carl Huysmont called Havre Bord, which was very famous at the time. So it would make sense that he was referring to this. So maybe there's truth behind this, maybe not. But in either case, a tea always makes you think. And it definitely made me think this whole experience. Naturally, as I was immersing myself in Satie's unique and quirky world, I was inspired to write music. And this happened very naturally. It wasn't part of the plan. And I ended up writing this piece called For the Missing Pastry. I was definitely inspired by Satie's music, but in no way was this an exercise kind of like the how to sound like Satie video I did a few years back where I was breaking down his style. I was more so influenced by Satie's whole demeanor, how it's full of irony and wit. It kind of skirts between having a deeper sense of purpose and aimlessness. It's a bit clownish sometimes with an anti-serious approach to things and I just love that he's full of innovation and he's truly, truly one of a kind. I also really love that Satie's music doesn't really try to be anything. And it's really in line with his concept of furniture music, or as he called it in French, musique de meublement, which is music not meant to be deliberately listened to, but rather to be a natural part of the environment. I also read that Satie often wrote music while walking and in cafes, so I tried that. And this was really interesting for me because a lot of times when I'm writing music, I'm tied to not only how the music sounds, but how it feels in my fingers as a pianist. And this practice allowed me to break free from that. And because of that, I came up with different ideas, I think. I was humming a lot, I was singing, and focusing on listening. I hope you enjoyed this experiment with me and the music I made. Also, before I end this video, a quick announcement, a quick favor from you all. I'm putting together this piano slash music book. 
And in order to make it as effective as possible, I would love your input to just gather information. So if you can take a few minutes and fill out the survey, it will be very much appreciated. Thank you so much to my patrons on Patreon as always. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you very soon in the next video.